we would like to thank our speakers for the discussion. Our last topic for today will be Sustainability of the Fashion Industry in the New Era by Lady Kinvara Balfour. A look at future trends in fashion, lifestyle and beyond from the Shout About It resale market and the mega brand fight for the needed now generation to AI, tech, micro-living and the arrival of the supermall. This is a look at the way the digital landscape is changing our world and our individual lives. We now welcome Lady Kimvara Balfour. Hello everyone. It's such an honor to be speaking to you all today. My name's Kinvara and we're going to be talking about the sustainability of the fashion industry. Not just sustainability of fashion itself, um, but the actual fashion industry. I wish I was there with you in person. I've really missed traveling so much in these times. Um, and we are all, the majority of us, working from home. And that comes, with that comes some real shift in cultural trends. So I'm going to start looking at that a little bit. Um, and then we're going to look at the fashion industry, how it was pre-COVID and how I think it'll be post-COVID. Um, and we will regard COVID as a big but small bump in the road um, in terms of the trends that are coming up. So I think I'll start sustainability in the fashion of the fashion industry uh, in the new era. So I, what I wanted to talk a little bit about first is the new urban landscape. Before we look at the actual fashion industry, I just wanted to show a little bit about how we're all living today. So the new urban landscape is one that is very, very small, um, overpopulated, and results in the fact that we're all living in smaller houses. Everyone's migrating to the cities. Now, obviously with COVID, we've seen a slight shift in that, and a lot of people are migrating to the countryside to escape this pandemic. Um, but I don't believe that's a long-term shift. I truly still think that once we're all back up and running, cities will be the beating heart of any country. And as computers and AI takes over some of these jobs that we used to do, especially with things like farming, people are going to have to migrate and flock to cities in order to actually earn a living. And what we're seeing in countries like China and Japan is a huge trend in micro living. And we can just see a few examples here. These people, I feel unbelievably sorry for them during the pandemic, because as we've all been stuck at home, to have been stuck in these small spaces must be absolutely torturous. But this really is how a lot of people are living. So in these little small houses where rents are growing, the cost of living is growing, the cost of food is growing, People can afford only so much living space. What do you relinquish when you downsize? Firstly, I'd say the white goods, the washing machine, the tumble dryer, the cooker perhaps, because we have all these delivery services and robots that can deliver our food to our door at the tap of a button on our smartphone. So there's a lot of things that have been relinquished in the home and these become basic living models with bed, of course, a desk is one of the key points in these houses and some basics and uh, probably no television because we can all watch on our smartphone or our, or our you know, laptop. So these are just lots of examples of different people. And I just wanted to talk about that. So if you're relinquishing all those home comforts, you need to go outside to use them. And the subject of fashion we're all still going to need to wear clothes. Whatever happens in the world, there are two basics that we need to know about the human. One, we are social animals. We cannot live in isolation. We are social beings, we are social animals. If we do that virtually or physically, it doesn't matter, but we are social. Number two, we like to be clothed. There is no doubt about it. Whatever happens in the world, in the planet, humans will always need some form of clothing. So if anyone's working in the fashion industry for whatever, we can all rest assured that whatever's going out of the window uh, 
in, in, in other markets, we're all needing clothing and socializing. So at the moment, we've seen this big thing in the rise of the laundry bar. So people are living in smaller houses and going out to do their everyday chores. So I've got a lot of examples here because I really wanted to reiterate what, it, what a big trend it is. These laundromats are becoming bars, nightclubs, laundries. Uh, they offer Wi-Fi. They offer food. If you're 20, 20 years, years old, old, this, this is, is where, where you're going, going probably three times a week, four times a week to socialize, to do what you need to do, to go back to your very small house and carry on living, working. Another one in Tokyo, very clean, very chic, everybody's in uniform. This for me is the new, is the new cafe society and we'll see that happening over the next 10 years with the young. Another laundry bar, coffee and laundry Hong Kong. These are everywhere now. In addition to that, we see a real rise in the new co-working space. Now, obviously these places have suffered during the pandemic, but I suspect they've only suffered a short term. There's many at the moment, if we've all been stuck at home, and I think we all agree, if we have a partner working from home and we're trying to homeschool children in the same, under the same small roof, then someone's going to need to get out of the house to concentrate. Um, and these co-working spaces are going to have their moment in the next few years, even if schools remain closed, which they are here in America. Um, so we work, we all know about that big and tiny, another one in Los Angeles, which is a working space also with children, second home, a big, big brand that's taking over the world, creating your second home because your first home is just too small and, and difficult to live in full time. Spring place, Albright collective. This is a working space just for women A metropolitan workshop. There's plenty of them and they are and were popping up all over big, big cities all over the world. The wing, another really posh one and Soho works, which comes from Nick Jones, who managed who founded Soho house. This has its own podcast offices. Um, it's extremely well thought out. And I think we have to understand now that people are no longer having to go to vast, big, ginormous machine offices in order to work. People are hybrids. They're working uh, of, of, for their own, on their own selves. They're self-employed and they need these outdoor spaces to work. So we see that people are out and they're socializing on a bigger scheme. On a bigger scale, I wanted to talk about the super malls. So if we're looking at the sustainability of the fashion industry, now these malls have obviously taken a huge hit during the pandemic and I feel for them deeply because there's a lot of them that are extremely pleasant, wonderful places to be. And I know that when I've been shut at home with a two year old, I would have loved to have gone out to the shopping center um, a little more. And I think that after the pandemic, these malls will really come back into their own when people realize how tired they are of being at home and how few facilities they have in their house. And this is where I think the fashion industry is really going to be a booming, booming business. So we've all been shopping online. We all know it's easy to press a button. But as social beings, we want to socialize. We want to feel and touch and see what we're eating, what we're buying. It's all very easy to open it up in a box and get it to the doorstep. But after time, we need to go out. And where do we go? So there's a huge rise in the super mall. And when I say super, I mean super. These places aren't just shopping precincts like they were in the 60s and the 70s. Even then, they were considered radical. These are super malls. They have, they are, they are like, uh, you know, Disneyland. They've got cinemas, multiple restaurants, valet parking, beauty centers, salons, shops. Yes, um, they are experiential to the first degree. Uh, Icon Siam, Hudson Yard is in New York. Uh, that beautiful building built by Thomas Heatherwick, a friend of mine, great British architect which I know is suffering right now and I feel deeply for them, but I'm sure it will come back bigger and stronger. Iran Mall is claimed to be the biggest shopping mall in the world. And I think we have to remember, and I'm sure this is appropriate and relevant to all of you in Cyprus, as the world does heat up and as we face a real issue with global warming and temperatures rise, 
there are very few places to escape. If you're living in Iran and it's 45 centigrade, 50 centigrade for some months of the year, you're either indoors or you're in a, in a super mall enjoying the private cold air conditioning and basically living in there. These become like second homes. Um, Nordstrom Local, I wanted to include that because that's quite a big new trend where department stores are setting up mini outlets on the high street where people can pick up their online orders, get things altered. And these are really serving those people who need a little extra care, but don't necessarily have the ability to go to these huge stores. And then if you can't afford the rents in a super mall, you can start to afford the, the rents on a vending machine. Now there's a real rise in the vending machine here. These are assorted vending machines selling all sorts of different things from juice in downtown LA to sneakers, uh, chef in box, that's cook uh, food. Um, I think we'll see a real rise in these. People still want to go out to get some things. Nothing, everything coming to the door via Alibaba or Amazon is all very well, but I think we all are starting to, we want to go out and choose what we're going to buy. This on the bottom is a car vending machine. You order your car online and you go in with a code and you drive your car away. It's the ultimate convenience. It may scare some people. Um, and again, these are where the machines and computers and AI of the world are putting real live people out of business, but it's incredibly convenient. And if you trust a brand enough, you'll go and do that. The same that you trust a chocolate bar to come out of a vending machine in a doctor's waiting room, you trust that brand, you know what you're getting without having to have a human being relay it to you. This is happening with sneakers, underwear, uh, phone chargers, water, anything. So if you're in the fashion industry, I really urge you to consider this because I know that rents on shops and retail spaces are extortionate. And in the pandemic, people are really suffering. And yet people want to get their brand out there. So I wanted to also talk now about the new sustainability of fashion itself. We all know that the overbuying, the overconsumption of everything, including fashion, is becoming a huge problem for the planet and therefore for us, for animals, for humans, for nature. And there's a beautiful documentary uh, film called The True Cost, which my friend Livia Firth produced, I think it's on Netflix, called, yes, The True Cost. I really urge you to watch it because it really looks at how all this excess cheap fashion that we all buy and think, oh, I can give it to charity after five wears and therefore I'm not such a bad person. We now know that if a t-shirt costs $4.99, someone's probably been paid about 50 cents to make it. We wear it a few times, it falls apart, it ends up in landfill. And when it's in landfill, it seeps into the ground and creates real issues for the people living in the place where the landfill is, such as Haiti, where children are getting really bad diseases, such as vitiligo from all the chemicals in the water that are literally in the ground from all this, you know, dumped fashion. So there's a real trend now in rent and resale. <clears throat> I'm just going to use show a few examples. Rent the runway. That's a really, really big trend now. You can rent what you're going to wear for a couple of days, rent a dress for a wedding and send it back rather than buying something new. These are a lot of other examples all over the world. Nova Octo, MS Paris. Rent more, waste less. That's something that's really, really taking over in the fashion industry. And it's no longer something to be ashamed of. Where, whereas thrift store and vintage shopping was a badge of something of a badge of honor a few decades ago, um, when it used to be something you'd sneakily be ashamed of that you were buying something in the old secondhand charity store, it suddenly became a real badge of honor. Now the rental market is becoming a real badge of honor amongst the young and the old, amongst everyone. And it makes financial sense and it makes environmental sense. Tuileries, another one. And then the Real Real, which is a big one based in America, which uh, has a very clever concept because it has not only an online platform, but it has brick and mortar stores. Now, 
I have one. There's one in, in Los Angeles, one in New York. Uh, these are beautiful, extremely high-end stores that have been built like a department store would be for, for first-hand, full-cost clothing. They have nice customer toilets, candles, coffee books, a cafe inside. And this is all centered around second-hand clothing. And this company's really turned that whole model around and reminded us all that it is okay to rent. And Gucci, they had such a big market in Gucci when they started that Gucci and Alessandro Michele, the designer at Gucci, have officially just joined forces with the real real to say, okay, we're gonna cultivate and curate our own Gucci secondhand store under the real real umbrella. So rather than Gucci saying, we discard and we disregard all this secondhand, this is for poor people, we don't want to be a part of it, we're just focusing on our new. They're taking, I mean, it's obviously a financial move as well, but they are taking social responsibility to say, we support and we help the rent and resale of our fashion rather than just everybody buying something brand new. Vestiaire Collective, another one. And then First Dibs, this is also not just the fashion uh, industry, but the uh, furniture and art and jewellery industry is having a huge resurgence with second hand everybody buying irrespective of whether it's a really valuable antique or not it's okay now to buy um second hand pieces and pr show them proudly off in your home the kardashians i included this because i thought it was interesting that the kardashians got a thing called kardashian closet where they're reselling their own clothes and that is doing big business and then thread I wanted to talk about a little bit about in the uh, fashion trend world is this concept of having your own personal stylist. So with thread, you tell a stylist, an algorithm, in fact, and a stylist, what you like to wear, what your needs are, what your lifestyle's like, and they send you a, ser a series of clothes, a little few outfits to you, back to your door. Um, that if you don't like you return if you like them you keep them and you pay for them uh i've never tried these services because i'm fortunate enough that i can normally go out shop choose but for some people who are scared to go out or too busy these services are becoming real godsends there's quite a lot there's another one in america called stitch fix that's doing really really well um, and I think in the pandemic, these things are doing well. We have to remember, however, in the pandemic, that most people aren't dressing up like the Kardashians every day um, to socialize. I think we see all the athletic brands, the athleisure brands like Lululemon and Allo Yoga, Nike. They're all doing really well because we've all been at home in our track pants. Um, and on that note, I think it's really interesting uh, now, if I do go out to some of the malls that are open, you start to see which brands are really, really leading the way in society today because you see those are the ones with queues outside and other stores remain completely empty. And for me, where I live, I've been observing it quite a lot. Zara, queues outside all the time. Nike, queues outside and Lululemon. And Gap in fact, here in America. I think this is where you really start to see why are these brands winning? They were winning long before the pandemic. They're maybe managing pandemic customer uh, activity better than others, but in general, it's wear a mask and you know you can only have a limited number of people in a store at a time, which is a rule everyone has to adhere to. But the love of the brand has kept those people queuing outside, come rain or come shine, in their mask, to go and go back to that store that they love so much. And those really are the key brands that one should always just keep an eye on. What are they doing well? What, how are they doing it? I think in Zara's case, they just are brilliant at the online portal as much as they are with the brick and mortar. So there's equal numbers for both. So there's not an inconvenience to order online and feel that you need to go to a store to continue that purchase, to continue that customer experience. Um, and as we know, the founder, you know, he's, he's one of the richest men in the world and there are Zara stores all over the world. And I don't think they will suffer as much as other chains in the pandemic from what I've seen. Now, I just wanted to talk about the upcycle. So we've rented and we've resold. Now we look at the trend of upcycling, which, again, is nothing to be ashamed of anymore. 
this is a nice image I chose of Converse Renew. Converse are making their high tops out of recycled plastic bottles. Um, and I loved this tagline, life's too short to waste. And I think we all have to be really, really, uh, we have to be really uh, aware now of the concept of waste, not only with our supermarket trash, the food we eat, the receptacles that all the takeaways come in during this pandemic, which gives me a heart attack. Um, but in our general, general, the waste of fashion. So this is just a couple of examples. Levi's have just set up secondhand where they will, you take in your old Levi's jeans, you get a gift voucher in return. They then resell them on basically. They're not re-stitching them up. They're not doing anything. They're not making them into something else. They are just reselling those old secondhand Levi's um, and marketing them very well and saying they're lived in and worn and cool and comfortable. Um, and then cos resell, buy what you want from cos and resell it back when you're bored of it and they will give you some vouchers in return. The new long term use is something, these shoes aren't the most fashionable, but this is something that I see something like Gucci or Prada or Chanel are going to adopt anytime soon in the next few seasons of their shows. So people are making, these are originally made for children in Africa a charity called Because, where they saw that children needed shoes, um, but they obviously grow out of them so quickly. Uh, so they created a shoe that grows. And this shoe can change into five different sizes as the child, child's foot grows. Um, and I really, really do see some of the bigger brands adopting this concept. Expandles, another brand. Um, it's just, it's, it's, they're not the most stylish, but it's an extremely clever concept that I think will take off in the, in the high designer world and the high street world quite soon. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about social media for the next five, 10 minutes. We know that social media is absolutely a huge part of our zeitgeist out there in the big world and within our small internal words, worlds. And in the pandemic, I think we've all realized how reliant we can be on social media. I'm not one to say that people are addicted. I don't think it's fair to say that the world is addicted to social media, but certainly it's something that's ended our lives in the last 15 to 10 years that is absolutely infiltrated our psyche on a daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes minutely basis. So where are we with social media? I wanted to talk about just the four key ones, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. As we know, these companies are starting to get criticized for the sheer power that they have. Um, they all originated out of Silicon Valley. They had free reign for a long time. And now they're all starting to be questioned is how much power do they have and how much power do their founders have? And I think we have to be aware if we're looking at the sustainability of the fashion industry, in my view, the fashion industry is hugely reliant on these platforms. And these platforms are extremely influential and very beneficial to any brand. These days, we know that if you are a t-shirt brand launching to market from the very, very start, in the olden days, you'd have to get a buyer at a department store to possibly take on maybe 10 to 20 to 30 units of your new product, put it out on the shop floor, hope that people would see it. There's much less footfall in the stores now. How do you get people to see your product? You choose social media. And we've seen now with Instagram, which is one of the biggest tools, that you can shop directly on Instagram. I've done it myself. Um, there's plenty uh, of brands that are just launching from nowhere and becoming really big on Instagram, TikTok again. I just wanted to talk a little bit about Facebook. So we see this, Facebook helps you connect and share with the people in your life. Now, I think the concept of all of this is that we have to remember we are all humans and we have a passion to share. And this is where these social media platforms have really... Uh, have really won the game. And I think they can be used responsibly, but I think we're all starting to look at uh, the reality versus, uh, you know, Instagram versus reality. Um, these are tools to keep the fashion industry sustained. 
but they're also tools to keep a political landscape sustained, to keep some quite scary messaging sustained. And I think we have to start to learn these things, really use these things responsibly. There's two documentaries. Uh, which are out now, I urge everybody to watch. This has nothing to do with fashion and everything to do with our social and political behavior. One is The Great Hack and one is The Social Dilemma. Both are on Netflix and they do look at the evil, sinister, macabre, whatever you want to call it, powers at play, working and using these platforms. So alongside some nice influencer in her Chanel, you might be getting an advert for Black Lives Matter protest and you might think, oh, that's interesting. That's related to the nice influencer that I follow subconsciously. And what we realize is actually there's all completely separate and greater countries, greater powers and disruptors are buying millions of dollars worth of adverts on these platforms and creating social unrest um, and dis-ease. And the social dilemma looks at that and says, look, you know, the world seems that it's quite crazy right now. How can that be? But on a, on a lighter note, I do think if you're a brand, a brand uh, new or old, if you are in any way, shape or form communing with a consumer, whether you're selling cars, jewelry, champagne, whatever it might be, medical supplies, this is the easiest, cheapest, and best way to communicate directly with a customer. If you can't afford a shop or a presence on the street or a presence in the super mall. And I do think influencers really still have a huge part to play now. They are the advertisers of now. I was in a doctor's waiting room the other day in the magazine rack where I would normally pick up a copy of Vogue or Love magazine or whatever, Vanity Fair. It was empty because of the pandemic. It's not uh, hygienic to have magazines in the rack. And I found that really sad. I mean, it is what it is, but it's just a reminder that while these magazine pages and the influencers, which used to be fashion journalists and editors, they were the key influencers for a while. They're really being sidelined um, unless they start to create their own social media presence. Um, the, the influencers of today tend to be the real people, a mix of genders, a mix of ages, a mix of cultures, a mix of race. Um, and it's an interesting time. It's a really wonderful time as anybody can broadcast themselves. You know, the concept that YouTube set up, which was broadcast yourself, that was limited solely on YouTube a long time ago. And now everywhere we go, we can broadcast ourselves. I just urge everybody to do it responsibly. And then I wanted to finish just showing a few fashion visionaries. Some key names to know now. We all know the key fashion brands of now, Gucci, Chanel. These people are still leading the way. They're doing everything beautifully. They're doing things consistently. They're doing things persistently. But there are some up and coming interesting names that it's quite good to know and they're all on social media and you can follow them all. On that note, I do always like to talk a little bit about the marketing tools of life. I always do say to brands, be consistent and be persistent. If you're trying to attract a customer, a loyal customer, a one-off customer, whoever they may be, be consistent in your narrative, be consistent in your approach, be consistent in your brand identity, and be persistent. So it's all very well to post one thing on Instagram um, and then drop and then post something entirely different two weeks later. In my view, the social media is like going to the gym for any brand. Uh, no one's paying us to do it. We just do it to keep our brand looking fit, to keep our brand looking good. And there's nothing more boring than somebody saying, oh, you must be on Instagram. Um, you don't have to be at all. But if you are, I think it's really helpful and really beneficial to build a customer base, to be as consistent as you can be with your imagery, with your narrative, and that reflects on the product that you sell. So these are some of the key fashion visionaries to know now. Hungry, an incredible makeup artist. I think we really need to understand out there that there is a real metrosexual, transgender, genderless, whatever we want to call it. There's so many different ways, so many different ways of calling it. 
Um, it's no longer just that makeup is for girls and suits are for men. Everybody is enjoying everything. And these are people who are going to huge effort for social media, using it as a global platform for their work and starting to work with some of the key visionaries out there, Lady Gaga, etc. Iris Van Herpen, if we look at cheap fashion uh, becoming cheaper, then we also want to look at the couture industry, which as some of the wealthy people in the world want to stand out from the crowd. Um, and they find that Gucci or Chanel, even those are not exclusive enough. We do look at the world of couture. The queen of the uh, tech structured couture is Iris Van Herpen. Her work is incredible. She's hit the mainstream. Celebrities wear her things. Her shows are outstanding. They still capture everybody's imaginations on social media. She's really building a, a huge narrative and combining it with incredible technique. Um, and her stuff will be the things that have been seen, will be seen in museums for generations, centuries to come. House Labs, this is a makeup brand launched by Lady Gaga. It's relevant and interesting to me because it's, it's aimed at all genders, all races, all ages. Um, and we live in a world now where that's all something to celebrate and accept. And if you're a beauty brand, you've got such a huge... Uh, potential for customers out there, such a huge potential. So there's quite a crazy thing happening on social media with these morphs. Um, there's so many different names for them, there's quite a lot. There's another brand called Metier Fecal, which is extremely uh, radical, and yet these people are mainstream, mainstream on Instagram. And they've captured something in the zeitgeist. And they're freaky, they're alien-like, they're outer-worldly. They go to great lengths to, to, to create what they're doing. Um, they may be used by brands, but other than that, they're just doing their thing. They are creative artists, but they have massive followings. And I think it's just important to have them on your radar. Go Pei, this is a Chinese couturist, and this is what they call this couture beyond. I just want to, again, reiterate that while high street fashion became, becomes as mainstream as it can be, and there is a Zara shop on every corner, where do you go if you really want something intricate, special, not created by a machine, created by hand? Um, you go to the couture industry and it's, it's, it's booming, as booming as ever, perhaps not in the core months of the pandemic, um, but, but behind the scenes, these designers, these creators are gaining massive followings, not just from their visuals, but with their actual customers. And then finally, Lucy McRae, a friend of mine, who's doing some really interesting things where she's combining tech, science, and fashion. And I think that that's a really big thing in the fashion landscape and the fashion industry and the new era is people who are looking at how tech can support and improve fashion, not only in the making of fabrics, but the way in which we wear it, where it's sold, how it's sold, um, Lucy creates all sorts of different things for huge brands like Adidas and Nike. Um, and I think it's interesting to see that these brands are choosing to work with these boundary pushing, fearless, interesting new creators rather than just going to the same old fashioned designers for a collaboration for a pretty flower on a shoe. People are really pushing the boundaries out there because they feel it's good for the environment, because they think it's interesting for their brand. Um, and because that's the way that we're all merging is science, art, and fashion and tech are all merging. Um, and I am going to leave it there. I know we've got the conversation now, so I'm looking forward to that. Thank you all for listening to my presentation. I hope I wasn't speaking too fast about too much. There's always so much to say. Um, and I will leave it there for now and someone will jump in and ask me some questions.